It used to be that the white supremacists would say that white people are superior, and now the shoot gets on the other foot and say, it says that marginalized communities are the ones that ought to be given advantages. And I think neither of those is compatible with, you know, with true liberalism. Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall for The Spectator. Today I'm in Oslo and I have the privilege of being joined by political scientist, senior fellow at Stanford University and author of, amongst other books, Identity, Liberalism and Its Discontents, The Origins of Political Order and the famous 1992 book, The End of History and the Last Man. Francis, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Well, thanks for having me. Um, uh, forgive me if this is uh, uh, pot potentially uh, uh, tedious question because I imagine you, you might be asked this a lot, but I just for, for, for listeners and, and viewers who might need refreshing on your work, I, I, I wondered if we could, if I could take you back 34 years to your essay, The End of History, in which you argued uh, what we may be witness, witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post war history, but the end of history as such. That is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. But as I said in your speech yesterday, you were examining the, the fall of democracy and, uh, it's, it, and um, the failure of liberalism. So I wondered, how has your thinking changed over the last 34 years since you wrote that essay? Well, you know, what we've had in the last uh, 17 years or so is not the fall of democracy, but we've had setbacks. Uh, you know, the process of the development of democratic institutions is never a linear uh, process. And, um, you know, the end of history really uh, was a question of what direction is uh, historical progress moving in the modernization process. Uh, so, yeah, we've not done well. Uh, democracy has had a lot of setbacks. There are now some big authoritarian alternatives like Russia and China. Uh, setbacks in individual places that we thought had been making a transition to democracy, uh, Myanmar, Tunisia, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the broader historical question, you know, the one that I was the most interested in in writing that essay in that book is, uh, is there a superior form of human social organization the way the Marxists believed that the end of history would be communism? You know, that mm -hmm. this was a final stage that uh, would be superior to what they called bourgeois uh, democracy mm -hmm. tied to a capitalist system. And, you know, my argument was there is no clear, you know, higher stage that we're moving to. And I think that remains the case, but certainly we're in a period of democratic setback right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you, is, do I write in understanding this still a Hegelian idea that there is a concept of progress through history and art? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that. I, I, what I generally say to people that deny that there is uh, progress, I say, well, maybe you should try living for a while in Guatemala or the Democratic Republic of Congo. I don't want to pick those countries out particularly in, in an insulting way, mm -hmm. but you know, generally speaking, people flee that kind of country to go live in Norway or you know mm -hmm. uh, the United States or some you know rich democracy, and I think that you know, indicates the fact that there has in fact been progress. If you are a rich, industrialized, stable, peaceful democracy, mm -hmm. there are a lot of advantages mm -hmm. uh, over living in a poor, you know, unstable, uh, corrupt uh, 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 place. I would maybe push back on the idea that uh, if we, we, liberal democracy is the highest, uh, you, you're yet to see a, 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 a political theory higher than that. but. If people are voting against liberalism, as they are, and, and it seems that uh, it's, there's another wave of it in Germany, for example, the alternative for Deutschland, which is a uh, right-wing party, uh, uh, is, is now at 19% in the mm -hmm. polls. Um, uh, we see uh, conservative leaders, uh, Orban, uh, Maloney, uh, and we, we've seen conservative leaders uh, across the West uh, ri rising the polls. Wouldn't that suggest that many people, voters, don't agree that liberalism or liberal democracy is that, or liberalism specifically, maybe first we'll deal with that, mm -hmm. is the highest form. And actually, they think that they've been let down by liberalism. Well, I think that, uh, you know, and I actually developed this at some length in the book version of that end of history essay. Uh, there's a problem with, uh, you know, peaceful, stable, liberal democracy because 
people don't simply live for uh, material comfort and security. Uh, they have aspirations and they have pride and they have a sense of justice. And they oftentimes, you know, and the problem with liberalism is that it's based on a kind of universal recognition of your human dignity uh, that you share with every other human being on the planet. But, you know, there are times when that's not enough for people. And so they want to say, well, I. Uh, I'm not just a human being, not just a generic human being. I'm a Hungarian, and mm -hmm. I need to, re you know, preserve my Hungarian culture, whatever you know, you conceive of that being. Or, you know, in the case of India, which was really born a liberal republic, uh, uh, you now uh, have people voting for the BJP and this form of Hindu nationalism, which uh, I think is, you know, a more restricted understanding of you know, what holds India together and one that is potentially very dangerous uh, because, you know, there are a lot of people living in India that aren't Hindu. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, could be the root of uh, a lot of violence. And so I think that, you know, that was the origin of liberalism in the first place. Liberalism was born uh, out of the European wars of religion following the Reformation when Protestants were killing Catholics and vice versa for 150 years. And there was this uh, recognition by early liberal thinkers that you had to lower the horizons of politics and focus on just respect for life itself and not the good life as defined by a particular you know, religious view of, of human final ends. Uh, and, you know, it's something that is um, in constant tension with people's desire to ha live in societies that are defined by much narrower understandings of what the good or what the good life are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you're now seeing, uh, you know, a kind of resurgence of that. There's something that you actually, I think what, we're, we're, what you're getting at is the, 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 can nationalism and liberalism be reconciled? Because that seems to be the, the, the fault line a mm -hmm. little bit. And that is something that you wrote about mm -hmm. in the original essay and, and whether nationalism and, and also religion, but we'll, we'll, hopefully we can get to that, uh, ca uh, that they might be uh, ideological competitors to liberalism. Mm -hmm. Do you think that liberalism and nationalism can be reconciled? Oh, sure, they can be reconciled. I have actually a whole part of my last book, Liberalism and Its Discontents, devoted to the question of national identity, because I don't think you can have a political order of any sort unless you have a common understanding of your national identity. Mm -hmm. um, the trick for liberalism is that it has to be a liberal identity. That is to say, it's an identity that is accessible to all of the diverse people that may actually be living in your society, meaning that it can't be based really on a fixed characteristic like ethnicity or race or gender. Uh, you know, it really does need to be uh, inclusive of, you know, the actual population that, that lives in your society. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if it meets those criteria, yeah, people do need a sense of, you know, an inside and an outside, what defines citizenship, you mm -hmm. know, what core values uh, people share. And if it's a liberal society, those values ought to be liberal so that, you know, the virtue of tolerance ought to be something that is, you know, key to the national understanding of a liberal republic. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is something I've, I've heard you speak about, the grounding it in an, a greater idea. That mm -hmm. Nationalism can't be ground, grounded, and I, I, very few people would disagree with you here, in an ethno-national state, as we saw mm -hmm. in the 20th century all too clearly. And you've also, I've heard you argue that neither can it be grounded in a religious identity. And it needs to be a, a, an idea that, that uh, supersedes those. I, but I would struggle to find an idea that could supersede them, even liberalism. So let me take American mm -hmm. liberalism, for example. Uh, the, the foundational, uh, one of the foundational texts is the, um, the Declaration of Independence and that Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That's one of the foundations of liberal uh, thought, mm -hmm. but it is grounded in religion. Ultimately, that is a metaphysical presupposition. That they... Well, but it's one. Um, so you're right. I mean, uh, people do actually have to believe in liberal values to maintain a liberal republic. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't believe in non-liberal values, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so yes, there there is a restriction in that sense. That's true. Uh, but that's all I'm saying is that you know you have to have this fundamental belief that people want to live in a liberal society that is defined by tolerance for 
you know, people that disagree with you about certain fundamental questions, mm -hmm. but that you're going to respect those differences and not carry them into the political sphere and certainly not allow that to lead to violence. Uh, I think that's really the condition. What idea do you think that could bind a nation that is... Well, the idea of freedom. I mean, look, I'm here at the Oslo Freedom Forum. I think that, uh, you know, everybody at that forum has lived under an authoritarian regime that restricts your ability to speak, your ability to move around, your ability to travel, your ability to engage in kind of ordinary economic activity. I mean, all of these things. And I think people, you know, believe that their dignity as human beings is based on their uh, uh, ability to make those kinds of choices for themselves without the government saying, you have to do this and you have to do that. Mm -hmm. I think people really like that. And that is a kind of, uh, you know, they may not agree on the liberal solution necessarily, but they certainly don't like these restrictive regimes that really limit their liberty. So I think, you know, there is something in common. Now, you know, uh, liberalism by itself does tend to be a rather thin set of common values. And so it usually has to be combined with other cultural features. You know, it could be sports, it could be food. Language is extremely important. It could be sports. It could be sports, how, yeah. How, how would that work? Well, uh, there's a great example of this in, in, from Hollywood, uh, you know, the film Invictus. Uh, so this was the Rugby World Cup in 1996 when South Africa had just made its transition mm -hmm. uh, from uh, apartheid. And in the movie, you know, the whites in South Africa and their team, the Springboks, uh, you know, were in a way pitted against uh, the blacks who played soccer. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nelson Mandela has had this understanding that if you're really going to have this rainbow nation, uh, things like, you know, rooting for the same sports team is very important. And so mm -hmm. he took it upon himself to, you know, they were, th they were the sponsor of the World Cup and uh, he took it on himself to convince his fellow black South Africans to root for the Springboks. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, the Springboks happened to win that year, which was a very convenient thing. But, you know, it's an example about, uh, you know, no, no thick national identity is simply going to be built around sports. But it's one of those things that contributes to, you know, a sense of commonality. If you think about the United States, you know, the game of baseball was invented in the 1870s precisely to try to overcome the uh, division, you know, this serious division and bitterness that had been created by the Civil War that had happened just a couple of decades uh, earlier. And, you know, in fact, for many generations after that, baseball became one of the uh, defining characteristics of what it meant to be an American. Like, mm. you know, you watch these World War II movies and they think there's a Nazi spy. How do you find out whether he's a real American? You say, who won the 1943 World Series? You know, if you can't answer that, you're not an American. Unfortunately, you know, I think we've kind of gone backwards in our uh, sense of a common American national identity. And so mm -hmm. I think actually most American kids aren't going to be able to answer that equivalent question asked in, you know, in mm -hmm. 2023. But, you know, that's important. In, in the case of French Republican post-revolution national identity, language is extremely important. Uh -huh. Right. And again, language is one of those things that is accessible. So if you're Leopold Songor, you're a black uh, Senegalese poet, but you write in French, then, you know, the French mm -hmm. Republic will take you into the Académie Française mm -hmm. and, you know, you are considered a full French citizen. So yeah. that's that's what liberal identity, I think, is built around. Well, th those things certainly bind. Uh, and as an Englishman, I can mm -hmm. tell you when England play the football, it's one of the only times that it seems to unite the whole country and and uh, romantic as that story of, of, of South Africa were, and very real as it was as a un unifying force it, it wasn't so much the the foundation uh, stone on which uh, a unified nation could be built but rather a manifestation of wouldn't it Mandela's ideas of what the South African nation could be and it was him at the core oh yeah his, but his look, philosophy but, that, but look the, I mean national identities aren't just lying around there they're not biological facts you know, they're created there. And that's why you need leadership. Uh, you know, there's a there's two things that have to happen. If you have a viable political order, you have to have state building, which means the building of 
the kind of visible formal institutions, you know, the army, the police, the bureaucracy, the finance ministry, these sorts of things. But you also need the sense of common shared narratives and stories that you tell about, you know, your society. And mm -hmm. that's where leaders are extremely important because, uh, and sometimes the leaders aren't even political leaders. They can be poets, they can be filmmakers, they can be musicians, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, and all of those I think contribute to uh, a people having a single sense of what it means to be, you know, a member of their national uh, community. And that, yeah. Isn't that, having a religion uh, the ultimate sort of mythos to, to under the ultimate yeah, well, binding story? So that's, I mean, religion literally well, so means that's, to bind. That's the, that's, the, um, that's the difference between a liberal and an illiberal order, because if you're living in a country that has big religious divisions in it, if you pick a single one of those divisions, I mean, even, you know, even in the case of Protestantism, uh, there's so many sects within Protestantism that you're still not going to get national unity you know, just within that one, you know, branch of Christianity. Uh, and that's why religion has always been very problematic. That's why, you know, what Modi is trying to accomplish in India right now is extremely uh, problematic because, you know, there's 200 million Muslims living yeah. in India that aren't part of his understanding of what it means to be an Indian. And in fact, he's disenfranchising a lot of them. Well, that would be a, a problem, but uh, it, because it's it's a majority group, the Hindus, who are not tolerant of the minority mm -hmm. group. But if if you let's say take America, although uh, and, and going back to Protestantism, mm -hmm. uh, sure there were disparate groups of Protestants and, and, and different uh, different churches, but they were under the umbrella, so the ecumenical umbrella of Christianity. And um, although it was a liberal society, it was a tolerant Christianity. But they were the majority and it was that on which they could build a nation and a tolerant majority is that the liberal dream well i think a tolerant majority certainly is the liberal dream i think that there are important christian roots you know to democracy itself i mean the belief in the universality of human rights you know or the liberal acceptance of the equal dignity of all people ultimately if you trace it back historically does have roots, I think, in Christian universalism. Uh, so historically, that's a, a fact, but it doesn't mean that you uh, then need to take a particular strong form of Christian identity uh, as you know the dominant one in your society, because there simply won't be. I mean, you know, you have you have a bunch of these new uh, right wing conservative intellectuals, you know, Catholic integralists like Adrian Vermeule, this professor at Harvard, or uh, Patrick Deneen, this professor at Notre Dame has just written a book about post-liberalism. Yeah. And they basically want to go back to some kind of conservative Catholicism yeah. as the binding religion in the United States. You know, it's totally ridiculous. Yeah, they're getting into the theocratic uh, Yeah, realm. I mean, it's ridiculous. You cannot possibly do that in a, a society that is as diverse, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if the majority have a Christian cultural background. There's a lot of secular Christians in the world. And, mm -hmm. and the same problem in Israel right now, you know, that uh, maybe uh, apart from the uh, Arab minority, most Israelis are, uh, are uh, Jewish, but a lot of them are secular Jews. And so, you know, having a particular religious interpretation of Judaism as their national identity just isn't going to work in that kind of a society. With your nation, with your mm -hmm. country, America, uh, you, these post-liberals that you've you mentioned and, and the, the Catholic and integral, integralists, mm -hmm. they are responding to a failure of liberalism, post-liberalism. Well, <laughs> or, or their, their they claim, they, they claim, claim, yeah, they claim that uh, there's been a failure of liberalism. Uh, so where do the post-liberals get it wrong? Well, you know, I debated Patrick Deneen uh, last year about this, where he claimed that there's a liberal tyranny. You know, this, uh, this is a so-called woke uh, dominance of American culture. And it's just a wild exaggeration, you know, of... I, I think that contemporary America is one of the freest societies that's ever lived. Politically, you know, he and his conservative friends can complain about Joe Biden all they want. They can demonstrate. They can have their own religious community. Nobody's stopping them from doing that. The, the, the only areas where you get this kind of uniformity of liberal thought are, are on a restricted set of basically civil rights issues having to do with race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And that dominance is true only in certain 
kind of elite spaces like universities, you know, Hollywood, the arts, uh, and so forth. Uh, and there, you know, I think there is a there is a bit of a problem because a lot of you know progressive identity politics tends to get pretty intolerant, and mm -hmm. that's a you know that's a left wing threat to uh, to liberalism, but. You know, Patrick Deneen then goes from that to saying we live in a total tyranny. You know, I mean, no difference between us and China or Russia, and it's just it's absurd. You know, it's just absurd. Uh, do you, do you think um, in America there is a problem of of national unity? So it might not be an oppressive state as you as you argue, mm -hmm. but for, I, I'm watching from afar from my uh, for, uh, through my phone in in London, uh, looking at America only this week. I saw, uh, given that it's Pride Month, we had uh, um, some transgenders on the White, Ho White House lawn taking their tops off and, and wiggling their breasts uh, with, the, with the Pride flag draped uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, from, from the um, White House. And that obviously gets a huge reaction from patriots, American patriots. So it seems, and, and of course I appreciate that social media will d make divisions seem yeah. more pronounced, but is your country a divided country, and, and are you worried about its its future? Well, it's certainly divided. Uh, you know that transgender issue is kind of the tip of the sphere of you know a number of cultural divisions that have appeared, and uh, you know they play off of each other because uh, you know the people taking their tops off, the transgender people taking their tops off, really set off a you know a countervailing reaction on the right, mm. and uh, it closes the space for people that have a, you know, more moderate view of, you know, these kinds of, you know, sexual identity uh, issues, and they make it actually hard to talk about, you know, uh, those things. So that is a problem. I think there are actually, you know, deeper cleavages that are regional, that have to do with occupation, you know, the single biggest division, which, by the way, is not unique to the United States. It's, it's true of almost every country that's got a populist movement, is this fundamental social division between more educated people that live in big urban areas and less educated people living in smaller towns and cities and, you know, in the countryside. And uh, there's a very strong correlation between, you know, that kind of residence and your cultural views and then who you're going to vote for uh, in an election. Mm -hmm. Right. So in Poland, you know, in Warsaw, people are very liberal and uh, pro EU and, you know, they have their pride weeks and so forth. And, mm -hmm. you know, in the countryside, you got much more conservative religious people. And that's really kind of the base of the peace, the, the uh, law and justice party that's mm -hmm. that's been running Poland. And that's a that's a cleavage that's going through quite a lot of countries right now. Mm -hmm. Do, where, how do you see that cleavage playing out? Uh, where, where can just tying back to the earlier conversation? Mm -hmm. This was it. Where's where's the uniting myth to bring together the let's say the cosmopolitans of the cities? Yeah, with the well, it's richness it, of the of the countryside. Well, it's hard. Uh, it's hard to know, and I think probably every country is going to have a different path out. I mean, for example, Britain. I think you have that same division, but it's it's actually in a much milder form than the one in the United States. You know. Uh, as I understand it, there's poll data that suggests that actually support for immigration in Britain has actually gone up since Brexit, yeah. uh, and that as uh, has immigration, by yeah, the way, this as has immigration, right? Uh, but it's simply not the kind of neuralgic problem that's driving people into ever deeper, you know, polarization. Whereas that kind of thing is happening uh, in the United States. I think that the way that it ends is, you know, there are several ones. There, you could have simply a dem demographic uh, shift. I mean, because if you look at the real base, for example, of Trump supporters, they're all older voters. You know, they're people that are 50, 60, you know, uh, on up. And uh, there's some evidence that the coming generations, you know, they start out much more to the left. Uh, and it's very possible that there'll be a kind of, uh, you know, not just it's not just a cohort effect, but it's it's well, it is a cohort effect that they will continue to be more liberal as they get older. Meaning that social attitudes on some of these uh, cultural questions will simply shift, and uh, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that since populist voters are a minority in virtually every country uh, where they exist, uh, they will simply start to lose elections. Well, Donald Trump already lost three in a row, 
And I think if he loses again 2024... By the popular vote, you mean? Yeah, by uh -huh. the popular vote. Uh, if he loses again in 2024, a lot of Republicans are just going to you know, finally accept the obvious, which is this is not the route to gaining power in the United States. You know, that this form of grievance-filled uh, politics is just not working. Would you, uh, when you use the term populism, is that, is that how you define it, sort of extreme right-wing grievance-filled politics? Well, it's, uh, that's kind of the manifestation of it. Uh, a lot of it really has to do with a, you know, deep distrust of elites and this belief that there's a kind of an elite conspiracy taking place that uh, where the, you know, it's the red pill phenomenon that, mm. you know, they've taken the red pill and they realize that they've been taking the blue pill and they thought that their institutions were democratic and legitimate, but they suddenly realize that no, in fact, it's being run by this, you know, this evil Mr. Anderson. Right. So there's, okay, let's say there's a conspiratorial uh, extremist to, mm. to that group who mm -hmm. do think of such sort of evil lizard people mm -hmm. controlling things. and But it, it's not unfair to say there, there are an elite set of people, a class of people with a worldview fundamentally different mm -hmm. from the working classes of America, say. They live in the Hamptons, whereas the working class, you know, the farmers of, of Kentucky. Yeah. And, and, and so it's not completely unfair to say oh, no, there's it's not legitimacy completely. To, to their worldview. No, there's... there's um if you interpreted this in traditional class terms, they've got a real problem, right? Because globalization really did uh, damage the incomes and job opportunities of a lot of working class, especially working class, you know, white people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is something that could be remedied by, you know, the appropriate political and social policies. But what's bizarre, you know, in a way about American politics over the last generation is that people's economic self-interests have become detached from their political uh, views and they're much more concerned about these kinds of cultural questions than they are, you know, if, if they were really worried about, you know, losing their jobs and losing their social standing, they should be all in favor of Obamacare, you know, because yeah. then they won't lose their health insurance as well. But they're all voting against Obamacare and they've been persuaded to because really the politics has become sort of tribalized where, you know, even if your team is doing things that hurt your economic self-interest, you're going to keep, you know, you're going to keep rooting for it because you've been convinced that the other side is evil. That's what political scientists refer to as effective polarization, where you're not just disagreeing over policy issues, you actually hate the other side and, you know, think that their winning is going to mean you're losing and, mm. and this sort of thing. That's happening on both sides, though. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's it's more prominent, I think, on the right than on the left. Uh, but the two sides definitely set each other off. Uh, you know, the people on the left can say, well, these people are just a bunch of racists and ze xenophobic bigots and, you know, we don't have to listen to them. And that means that they don't actually have to accept the fact that, you know, there's a real economic problem mm. that's been created by big corporations moving their jobs, you know, to Asia. Mm. Well, you, you, you mentioned globalization and uh, the sort of root of what you're, you're saying. And, and, and I noticed in your speech mm -hmm. yesterday, you were uh, careful to uh, delineate yourself as a classical liberal, mm -hmm. liberal rather than a neoliberal. And, and mm -hmm. without neoliberalism, is that not sort of national liberalism? Is that is No, that... no. I mean, in terms of economic policy, it just means rewinding the clock to, you know, the period before the 1980s when you had the Chicago School and Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, you know, taking this uh, interpretation, this critique of the role of the state in the economy uh, and carrying that to extremes. Mm. Uh, that's really the problem, uh, that there was a demonization of the state, which led to, for example, deregulation of the financial sector that then led directly to the financial crisis in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I think that you can you know, believe in capitalism and property rights and all those good things uh, and still have a state that regulates, you know, the behavior of these big banks. There's, you know, we used to do it for decades and, you know, we had much more financial stability. So I think actually rewinding the neoliberal economic agenda is one of the easiest things to do. And in fact, Biden has already accomplished most of that. What about the, the, the sort of globali globalization aspect of neoliberalism? Yeah, well, that uh, is harder to unwind. Uh, what's being unwound right now is actually the strategic 
interaction with China, because I think that many people have realized that we become dependent on China for stuff that is militarily important, you know, like semiconductors, rare earths, you know, uh, many of the kind of leading technologies that will be important, not just for the economy, but you know, in terms of strategic competition. And so that part is being decoupled. Uh, but really, you know, US, Europe, and China are so interdependent that it's very hard to imagine, you know, we're going to stop selling soybeans to China, or things like that. So in, in that context, then, what is the future of liberalism? Of well, I, I mean, liberalism will, will do just fine. I mean, in the economic so what I was saying is in the sphere of economic policy, it's very easy to unwind neoliberalism, right? You mm -hmm. just re-inject the state, you start regulating markets again, uh, you pay more attention to social protections, you know, to people that are hurt by the fluctuations of, you know, completely free markets. And that's something that I think is underway in virtually every advanced country. So that part of it is is fine. It's a little bit harder to unwind the kind of progressive identity politics that has come to, you know, define the left, which is also a threat to liberalism because mm. a lot of it becomes very intolerant and... Well, it isn't liberal, I would argue. It isn't liberal and it also denies a fundamental premise about, you know, the universal equality of human beings because it says, well, actually, you know, it used to be that the white supremacists would say that white people are superior mm. and now you, you know the shoot gets on the other foot and mm. say it says that marginalized communities are the ones that ought to be given advantages and uh, and I think neither of those is compatible with you know with true liberalism it sounds like uh, uh, you're you're defending the sort of center the old center left uh, yeah well sure I mean I think the um, that basic center left you know social democratic formula was really what guaranteed the stability of democracy after 1945, uh, especially in Europe, but also in the United States. I mean, the New Deal was the American acceptance of the need for an extensive welfare state. And I think every modern democracy adopted some form of it. You know, they went overboard with it in terms of its long-term fiscal sustainability. And so they had to cut back and modify. But yeah, it's a winning formula. Yeah. And I think it continue continue to be a winning formula in the future. Well, on that positive note, Francis, uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for speaking with me, and I'm sure listeners would have, have loved it. So, thank you. Okay, Francis Fukuyama, thank, thank you so much. Thank you.